Welcome back Year 12, this is part 2 of chapter 38 and we left off um, Moira's story just as she had arrived at uh, the house of a Quaker couple and their two children and they're deciding what to do with her. I'm picking up here at this paragraph, I went to the can, which is the toilet. I went to the can, what a relief that was bathtub full of plastic fish and so on then I went and sat upstairs in the kids room and played with them and their plastic blocks while their parents stayed downstairs and decided what to do about me I didn't feel scared by then in fact I felt quite good fatalistic you could say so fatalistic um it's uh, uh that word there we've got not only the idea of fate in there as in everything's out of her control now it's external forces but fatalistic also that idea that what will be will be um you know and she can't control whether this ends up with her death or not anymore is out of her hands then the woman made me a sandwich and a cup of coffee and the man said he'd take me to another house they hadn't risked phoning and so we have the start here of the story of Moira's experience of the female um, underground uh, road that takes uh, women out of Gilead but also in this um, passage we have this real sense that there is an element of normal life still existing in Gilead and despite um, Offred and Moira's experiences in the Red Centre which is where Offred is whilst this is happening to Moira where they're very suppressed, very rigidly structured, you know, very uh, little contact with anything uh, other than, you know, their education and the other handmaids. We have these kind of this family and these children carry on with daily life as uh, normal. And that's, again, another hint about um, kind of how clever Gilead is. You know, it isn't this massive sudden change for everybody and it doesn't bleed into every single part of society and every single part of one's life. Anyway, so they've got another fam uh, house that they're going to take her to. They're not phoning so that they don't run the risk of being uh, uh, surveilled and caught. The other house was Quakers too. They were pay dirt. So this is success because they were a station on the underground female road. And we've heard a little bit about that because we've heard on the news, the propaganda that Offred watched just before the ceremony. Um, this idea of uh, precious resources being smuggled out to Canada and we've heard little tiny bits and we get more information once we get into the historical notes about the this underground female road. After the first man left, they said they'd try and get me out of the country. I won't tell you how, because some of the stations may still be operating. So after this time, they st there is they're still getting them out. Each one of them was in contact with only one other, always the next one along. There were advantages to that. It was better if you were caught, but there were disadvantages too, because if one station got busted, the entire chain backed up until they could make contact with one of their couriers who had, couriers who had set up an alternative route. They were better organised than you'd think. They infiltrated a couple of useful places. One of them was the post office. They had a driver there with one of those handy little trucks. I made it over the bridge and into the city proper in a mail sack. So here again, um, Moira as ever with this um, kind of very practical, rational, uh, unemotional description of her escape. If you compare that to Offred's description of her, her beating heart, her panic, her fear, her worry, her constant kind of... Uh, checking over everything in her mind uh, as she and Luke and the daughter try to escape. Um, and so we have uh, this really interesting idea that she's got a very kind of practical approach to life and death. Then we've got this humour. She sneaks uh, to the city in a in a mail sack in the back of a mail truck. Um, and it's kind of a cliche, a little bit like an old film where uh, people are kind of smuggled out of prison in the, in the laundry bag. I can tell you now are you that now because they got him this driver soon after that he ended up on the wall and again this kind of very unemotional way 
that Offred gives us this description. You hear about these things. You hear a lot here. You'd be surprised. The commanders tell us themselves. I guess they figure why not? There's no one we can pass it on to except each other. And that doesn't count. And so, um, again, a reminder that the women at Jezebel's are essentially in prison. There's no one that they can pass any of this kind of secret um, information onto, no matter what the commanders tell them, other than one another. And of course, women don't count, and particularly not the unwomen, which is what these la these women are in Jezebel's. I'm making it this sound easy, but it wasn't. I nearly shat bricks the whole time. One of the hardest things was knowing that these other people were risking their lives for you when they didn't have to. Didn't have to, but they said they were doing it for religious reasons and I shouldn't take it personally. That helped some. So again, we have that sense of sacrifice. And again, we've got um, uh, some interesting links here with Frankenstein and the sacrifices that characters make for one another in order to kind of risk elements of themselves to uh, help the survival of others. And then we've got this sacrifice that these Quakers make to help people like Moira. Remember, Quakers are deeply, deeply religious. Moira's gay. Um, and so there are some really interesting kind of risks that are being taken for people that you wouldn't necessarily have kind of lived in any form of community with. They had silent prayers every evening. Now we go into a description of uh, these people and their faith and they use their religious faith as a justification for why they're going against Gilead and to a certain extent it throws a spotlight on the religious hypocrisy of Gilead and that's particularly highlighted by these silent prayers. For the Quakers their faith is uh, very deep and very personal and very individual to them. For Gilead Faith is all about the external performance and being seen to be faithful to those around you. And that's why we have, you know, the prayer vagansas and the, the family household prayer meetings and the uh, soul scroll shops where prayers are said for you. And so we've got this kind of uh, this hint here that the, the Quaker's faith is deeper, perhaps truer, at least less hypocritical than the kind of commercialised, modernised, capitalist almost faith that's represented in Gilead. So they had silence prayers, that personal um, kind of commitment to their faith every evening. I found that hard to get used to at first because it reminded me of too much of that shit at the centre. It made me feel sick to my stomach to tell you the truth. I had to make an effort, tell myself that this was a whole other thing. I hated it at first, but I figure it was what kept them going. They knew more or less what would happen to them if they got caught, not in detail, detail, but they knew. By the time they'd started putting some on TV, the trials and so forth. So again, we have this sense that the faith that the Quakers have is part of their kind of way of surviving in Gilead. And then um, we have uh, this idea that despite now these public trials of um, uh, of heretics or uh, traitors to regime, and so this kind of this dramatised public executions and trials, these people are still prepared to risk their lives for Moira. It was before the sectarian roundups began in earnest. As long as you said you were some sort of Christian and you were married, for the first time that is, they were still leaving you pretty much alone. They were concentrating first on the others. Then they got more or less, when they got them more or less under control, they started in on everybody else. And we have this kind of creeping, shifting goalposts that we have in Gilead with, you know, at the beginning, uh, you know, these various, you know, some people were... Uh, targeted and then as as those people began to disappear more and more and more and more groups were brought in and targeted and we have that sense then that um of the of the kind of the fear that you have you don't know when gilead is going to turn on you i was underground it must have been eight or nine months 
was taken from one safe house to another. There were more of their, those then. They weren't all Quakers. Some weren't even religious. Some were just people who didn't like the way things were going. So we have this sense of this period of time of Moira that she's managed to stay out of the system for eight or nine months, which is, you know, a significant success. And then we have uh, this revelation that there were some people in Gilead who rebelled, who were part of the resistance. And it wasn't just to do with religious faith. I almost made it out. They got me up as far as Salem, then in a truck full of chickens to Maine. And so again, Salem, as you know, is associated with the Puritan witch trials. Um, and so we have this sense then of this kind of uh, this idea of women being captured, women being uh, put on trial and accused of things. Um, and then we have, as ever, Moira's humour. I almost puked from the smell. You ever thought what it would be like to be shat on by a truckload of chickens, all of them car sick? They were planning to get me across the border, not by car or truck. That was already too difficult, but by boat up the coast. So even in the midst of this description of these moments of intense tension and danger and fear, Moira is giving us this humour again. And we begin to see that that's part of her way of surviving. So they aren't taking her across the border to Canada uh, by on land, by walking or boat or truck or anything like that. They're actually going to put her in a boat and row her across the border uh, uh, by the sea. I didn't know that until the actual night. They never told you the next step until right before it was happening. They were careful that way. And again, we have this sense of this real, this resistance isn't kind of... Uh, or organic or uh, spontaneous or by luck. This is a really kind of well strategized, carefully crafted plans. So I don't know what happened. Maybe someone got cold feet about it. Maybe somebody outside got suspicious. Maybe the boat, maybe they thought the guy out in his boat at night too much. By the time it must have been crawling with eyes up there and everywhere else close to the border, the border, whatever it was, they picked us up just as we were coming out of the back door to go down to the dock. Me and the guy and his wife too. They were an older couple in their 50s. They'd been in the lobster business back before all that happened to the fishing shore, the shore fishing there. I don't know what became of them after that because they took me in a separate van and so we have uh, again, so the, it, you know, we we suspect what happens to these uh, people. They're interrogated for any information that they uh, that they know in order to break down the network. And then they're either executed as traitors put on the wall or they're sent to the colonies, which we find out more about. But also here to do with the shore fishing, we have this reminder that not only is Gilead's um, uh, kind of this uh uh, dealing with this political systematic change, but also the, the, the country of North America has undergone these enormous environmental disasters, which is another reason why they've been thrown into this state of chaos. I thought it might be the end for me. Or back to the centre and the attentions of Aunt Lydia and her steel cable. Remember, that's what she used on Moira's feet. She enjoyed that, you know. She pretended to do it, uh, to do all that love the sinner, hate the sin stuff, but she enjoyed it. And we have, again, this kind of perverse sense of Aunt Lydia's enjoyment of this power and control and manipulation and abuse. I considered offing myself, and maybe I would have if there'd been any way. But they had two of them in the back of the van with, with me, watching me like a hawk. Didn't say a hell of a lot, just sat there and watched me in that wall-eyed way they have. So it was no go. And again, we know how good Gilead is at ensuring that uh, women, particularly fertile women, aren't um, able to uh, take their own lives. And then we've got that lovely um, uh, description of the guards as wall eyed. And of course, that's kind of blank and staring, but also that sinister undertone of, you know, she's she's being taken in by the eyes. She may end up on the wall. We didn't end up at the centre, though. We went somewhere else. 
I won't go into what happened after that. I'd rather not talk about it. All I can say is they didn't leave any marks. And so we have Moira this time using the same strategy that Offred does, which is just by blanking out those memories of her interrogation and her torture. And however that's happened, it's happened in a way that she isn't physically damaged. When that, the torture interrogation, was over, they showed me a movie. Know what it was about? It was about life in the colonies. In the colonies, they spend their time cleaning up. And here we have a description of the colonies, which is really great because we need to have this kind of further light shed on uh, Gilead for us. And the, uh, the men and women or the unmen and unwomen that end up in the colonies are essentially Gilead's clean up teams. And so we have that lovely symbolism of their punishment for their sins um, against Gilead is to clean up not only uh, the mess created by the wars and the various kind of rebellions, but also the environmental mess. And so where they have been dirtied by sin, they are cleaning up the sins that are present in Gilead or to, to kind of purify. So they spend their time cleaning up. They're very clean minded these days. Sometimes it's just bodies after a battle. And so they go in and they're the ones that clean up the bodies after a battle on the front lines. The ones in the city ghettos are the worst. They're left around longer. They get rottener, these the bodies. This bunch doesn't like dead bodies lying around. They're afraid of a plague or something. And another hint here at, um, you know, the kind of the issues with... Um, the, the various environmental chemical disasters that have happened. So the women in the colonies there do the burning. And so they are the ones that are in charge of disposing of these bodies. The other colonies are worse, though. The toxic dumps and radiation spills. And so we've got another reminder here of the environmental disasters. And we've looked at Three Mile Island. Um, and in a lot of ways, uh, Margaret Atwood's very prophetic in this section as she describes the environmental disasters that could have created Gilead. Three Mile Island has already happened when um, The Handmaid's Tale has been written. But Chernobyl, which actually comes after the publication of the story, you know, Margaret Atwood could be, you know, prophesying. She could be, you know, thinking about the consequences of something. And it seems exactly like that. So the toxic dumps and radiation spills, they figure you've got three years maximum at those before your nose falls off and your skin pulls away like rubber gloves. And that's the radiation poisoning. And again, uh, we've got evidence of that. We've talked about Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki and the atomic bombs already. They don't bother Fiji much or give you protective clothing or anything. It's cheaper not to. Anyway, they're mostly people they want to get rid of. They say there's other colonies, not so bad, where they do agriculture, cotton, tomatoes and all that. But those aren't the ones they showed me the movie about. And so we have, again, this is another form of prison, another form of punishment in Gilead. It's old women. I bet you've been wondering why you haven't seen too many of those around anymore. And so, um, again, what do you do with these old women who aren't useful to Gilead, aren't fertile? Um, and so you can't put them on the wall unless they've committed a crime. And so it's not, you know, they are they're not useful for the propaganda machine of Gilead. So they can go to the colonies and handmaids who've screwed up their three chances so who are proven to be not fertile and incorrigibles like me. And so these are individuals not worth re-educating. Discards all of us. They're sterile, of course. If they aren't that way to begin with, they are after they've been there for a while. And again, that's the radiation. When they're unsure, they do a little operation to you so there won't be any mistakes. I'd say it's about quarter men at the colonies too. Not all those gender traitors end up on the wall. 
So here we have this hypocrisy uh, in Gilead. Again, every child is a is a is a blessing. We hear every child is a is a is a child that is wanted in Gilead, except for the ones that may be born um, to the unwomen who could be fertile. So they, you know, remove the ability of women to get pregnant by uh, giving an operation. Of obviously that would to do with something to do with severing the ovaries. And then we have men there as well, which is why they need this. And this is not all of the gender traitors, which are mostly homosexuals, ended up on the wall and they send them to the colonies as well. All of them wear long dresses like the ones at the centre, only grey. Women and men too, judging from the group shots. I guess it's supposed to demoralise the men having to wear a dress. Shit, it would demor demoralise me enough. How do you stand it? Everything considered. I like this outfit better. So we have the humiliation of um, uh, kind of men um, being forced to wear dresses. And we have this kind of this almost parody, this mockery of homosexual men being asked to wear a dress. Then we have this div colour grey devoid of any indiv individuality, any kind of flamboyance, flair, any personality. And so we have these people who are at the colonies are essentially just disposable slaves cleaning up the parts of Gilead that Gilead itself doesn't want to touch and Moira says everything considered I like this outfit better and then as we read this last section of the chapter we're going to think about to what extent Moira is still representative of the hope and survival that Offred has to how much has her experience in Gilead changed her so after that they said I was too dangerous to be allowed the privilege of returning to the red centre remember the irony of that they said I would be a corrupting influence I had my choice they said this as in Jezebel's or the colonies and of course by forcing Moira to choose she takes ownership and responsibility for her choice and she becomes complicit just like with Offred there's nothing happening to Moira that she hasn't agreed to well shit nobody but a nun would pick the colonies I mean I'm not a martyr I already had my tubes tied years ago so I didn't even need the operation nobody in here with viable ovaries here either you can see what kind of problem that would choose, cause. And so um, Moira makes the choice to become essentially a prostitute. Of course, she's not paid in um, Jezebel's. So here I am. They even give you face cream. Again, we have this irony like that, some sort of amazing benefit. You should figure out some way of getting in here. You'd have three or four good years before your snatch wears out and they send you to the boneyard. Food's not bad and there's drink and drugs if you want it. We only work nights. And so we have this real sense of unease here as Moira tries to persuade Offred that she's better off with her at Jezebel's than as a handmaid. Because we realise that Moira has, just like Offred, accepted her reality. Moira, I say, you don't mean that. She's frightening me now because what I hear in her voice is indifference, a lack of volition, which is action. Have they really done it to her then? Taken away something? What? That used to be so central to her. But how can I expect her to go on with my idea of her courage, live through it, act it out? when I myself do not. And so Moira is no longer our rebellious hero. She's no longer Offred's rebellious, courageous kind of hero. The regime has won by breaking Moira just as it has broken um, Offred and they are both submissive to the regime. I don't want her to be like me give up go along save her skin that's what it comes down to i want gallantry from her swashbuckling heroism single-handed combat something i lack don't worry about me she says 
She must know some of what I'm thinking. I'm still here. You can see it's me. Anyway, look at it this way. It's not so bad. There's lots of women around. Butch paradise, you might call it. And we have this kind of parody that, despite being forced to have um, sex with all of these men, these commanders, whoever they are, that get brought to Jezebel's, she also is surrounded by women. And we have this kind of parody of uh, lesbian feminism here, butch paradise. Now she's teasing, showing some energy. I feel better. Do they let you, I say, as in have sex with women? Let hell. They encourage it. Know what they call this place among themselves? Jezebels. And so uh, we have here um, Moira's freedom to uh, be a lesbian here. Um, but that freedom comes at a significant cost, doesn't it? And then know what they call this place among themselves. That's the aunts. The word Jezebels, the kind of queen of prostitutes from the Old Testament, is a name that's given to this place by the aunts. The aunts figure we're all damned anyway. They've given up on us. So it doesn't matter what sort of vice we get up to. And the commanders don't give a piss what we do in our time off. Anyway, woman on woman sort of thing turns them on. What about the others, I say? Put it this way, she says. They're not too fond of men. And of course, because of the abuse um, and the situation that's, that they're forced into, they wouldn't be. She shrugs. It might be resignation. And of course, it is. She's resigned to her future just like Offred is. And then we have this break in Moira's narrative to this end of her story that Offred gives us. Here is what I'd like to tell. And we have her indulging in a fantasy. I'd like to tell a story about how Moira escaped for good this time. If I couldn't do that, I'd like to say she blew up Jezebel's with 50 commanders inside. I'd like her to end with something daring, spectacular, some outrage, something that would befit her, the old Moira, the strong Moira. But as far as I know, that didn't happen. I don't know how she ended, or even if she did, because I never saw her again. And we have this sense of foreshadowing um, that... Moira's ending is inglorious and we suspect that that's what Offred's will be as well because there is no way of having victory it appears over Gilead and that's the end of this chapter.